So we're very excited to continue our year-long discussion about veterans' issues and veterans' topics and affairs. And the topic that we're discussing today is one that's very, very important, and it's PTSD. And I know that um, the mental health community is actually looking to sort of change that particular title so that you're not looking at post-traumatic stress as necessarily a disorder. But it is something that many of our veterans are facing on a routine basis, be them young veterans or older. So this is definitely a topic that we feel is important, and we're very excited to have our speaker today. However, in order to introduce our speaker, I would like to call someone else up to the podium. And I'm actually going to call up Bob Carnegie. He is a wonderful person and a member of our veterans community, so we can all give him a nice round of applause. He's from the Indiana National Guard Employment Engagement Team. Thank you very much. And, uh for the opportunity to be here and introduce the speaker for this afternoon. Thank you all for showing up today and attending this with your mixed interests for the topic that we're going to discuss. Um, Jim and I have known each other for a long time, but the way we met, I'm sure no one in the room would have any idea. Uh, <clears throat> I was a baseball, a softball umpire and Jim was a catcher. And I told Jim and every other catcher that they were the best catcher in the world because then they would protect me better and I wouldn't get hit by the fastball. So Jim went through a lot of his life thinking that he was the best catcher in the world. And I had to confess that he wasn't. But, um, he and I have become great friends, but when I first met him and for many years, I never knew a picture like this existed. And our lives intertwined a couple different times. Never had any idea this picture existed. And one day I read an article in the newspaper about Jim and some of the work he had had and was doing and still does in the veteran community. And I said, wow, that's the guy that was the catcher. That's the guy that has a burning desire to help veterans. And guess what? I'm one, but nobody knew. Because my uniform, my memories, <coughs> to the best of my ability, were put in a box and put on my shelf in the back of my closet, unaccessible to the world and very poorly accessible by me. And it's a shame that there are many people, particularly from the 60s that served their country, have gone through that experience. And as I've gotten to know Jim and we've worked together on many projects, he has a burning desire to bring that experience that knowledge of what makes us tick to the forefront and his presentation today is an educational process so the community today of young people can understand what is being asked of our young folks when we decide it's time to go to another country and to participate in some of the wars that we have been exposed to. Uh, I think you'll find the next hour to be enlightening, educational, and I'm very, very proud to introduce Jim Chancellor, my friend. Thank you, Bob. I'm not sure. Uh, well, I, I am pretty sure that I'm still the best catcher, but um, it does, that really doesn't matter. I'd like to thank you all for coming out today and, and allowing me some of your time so I can explain some things to you that have been with me my entire life and that's the emotions of war. I'm gonna to talk to you about my war today. I can't talk to you about fighting in the streets of, of Baghdad or in the mountains of Afghanistan, just like today's heroes can't talk to, you, talk to us about fighting in, in uh, the jungles of Vietnam or the beaches of, of Omaha. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about Vietnam, which is my war. War knows no boundaries. It really doesn't matter where or when you serve this great country. For those of us that have fought for land and to, to live in peace and, and to uphold the American values, we all understand there's an unmistakable, intangible bond that exists between all combat veterans. We are sewn together with the same fabric, with the same thread. To give you an example of what I mean, I want to talk a little bit about the Gold Star families. I really don't think that a Gold Star mother, the salty tears of a Gold Star mother, know the difference between 1944 or 1969, or even today in 2016. Their great sacrifice and losses were the same. And it's the same with the courage and the commitment and the sacrifice of our veterans. 
the courage that, was, was, that it took in World War II was the same courage it took in Korea and the Vietnam and on into today's fight. You've all heard the poem by Lieutenant Colonel John McCrae during World War I when he challenged us all and he said, to you with failing hands I throw the torch. Be it yours to hold high. If ye break faith with those that die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Field. Let me take just a minute and tell you about that torch. We live in the greatest country in the, in the world, and it's because of our veterans. It's because of their commitment to our way of life, their commitment to sacrifice and courage that bind us together and keep us free. That torch was passed from the poppy fields at Flanders Fields where the poppies grow to the, to the beaches of, of Normandy. From the beaches of Normandy, it was passed to Ishan, Korea. And with that torch went the fire and the zest and the love of country that kept us free. Our commitment to America was strong. From Ishan, Korea, went to the jungles of, of South Vietnam. From there, went to the streets of Baghdad and Kuwait and into the mountains of Afghanistan. Our commitment to America was strong then and it needs to be strong today because we are the protectors and the guardians of this great place we call home. I've been to war. I served with the 119th Assault Helicopter Company in South Vietnam in 1969 and 70. I was a door gunner on a UH-1H helicopter. In April of 1970, we were at a place called Doc Siang. Doc Siang was a small base that was surrounded on three sides by mountain ranges. On April 21st of, of 1970, we were called on to, to put a, a Marine captain who wanted to go into Doc Siang, and it had been under siege for nine days, so it was, it was really dangerous. But we were flight lead, and so we decided to take him in. And what we did with a bump, I don't know, uh, it's called a lot of different things, it's called a splash or a bump, where you just go and you, you just touch down and, and the Marine would get off and we would go. Because if we stayed on that airstrip for very long, the VC had it wired with the incoming mortars. So we did the bump, and he got off. And as we, as we banked to leave, we started receiving a tremendous amount of small arms fire. Now, we had gun support with us, so the, the, the cracks in our gunships were working out. I was working out with my 60, but the ship, as it banked, took a tremendous amount of small arms fire. And then, then all of a sudden, there was hydraulic fluid just flying all around the helicopter ship, so we were losing hydraulics in our helicopter. And Steve Warren, who was flying the ship at that time, you know, I'm hollering at him through the mic. I said, Steve, we're going to make it? He said, yeah, we're going to be OK. And so after we left, after we actually got away from the intense combat, I asked him again, as the hydraulic fluid is flying all around, I said, Steve, we're going to be all right, right? And he said, Jim, you better buckle up. And what I heard next was, was something that I'll never forget. So I, I, I left my 60 and I sat down, and I buckled up, and I heard him say, mayday, 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 Gator 2-8 going down. Gator 2-8 request assistance, mayday, mayday. And so we crashed and, and, and went right down through the trees. Um, thankfully, no one was killed or captured. The uh, left side uh, gunner bit his tongue nearly completely off. The right side co-pilot had a compound fracture of his leg. Um, I had a broken right wrist and injuries to my back. We set up a perimeter and uh, uh, waited to be picked up. And within minutes, we were picked up and flown to safety. I'll never forget that day at Doc Siang. Actually, I'll never forget my entire time in, in Vietnam. I experienced all of the emotions of war. As a door gunner, sometimes I would cry as I saw people lay on the, on the floor of my helicopter with their friends rocking them back and forth saying, hold on, hold on, you're going to be all right. Hang in there, you're going to be all right. When we both knew that death was near. I laughed with a man who two weeks earlier was, was a complete stranger to me as he held up pictures of his kid sister and read me letters from home. And then there were the constant prayers. Every time we went on missions, there were prayers. Every time we did anything, it was a, it was, there were prayers for our safe return and my safe return home to my family and loved ones. I experienced all of those emotions in Vietnam and I experienced the emotions all of war, even today. They've been with me my entire adult life. And they're with, and they can be brought back to to vivid reality with the slightest of sounds or smells, just like they can for a lot of, of combat veterans. Now, before I begin, I want to tell you that I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not a psychologist or I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not even in the mental health field. 
I'm not here to talk to you about why our veterans say what they say or, or do what they do. I'm here to talk to you about war. I'm here to talk to you about my experiences in Vietnam and how they relate to war. But now that I've told you what I'm not, let me tell you what I am. You know, I'm an old carpenter that once a long, long time ago was a door gunner in a helicopter. I'm a man that's been married four times. I'm also a man who's been through drug alcohol counseling twice. This is my story and this is my journey and I appreciate you letting me share it with you. I'm going to show you four stills. I don't show you these stills to, to exaggerate war. I don't show you these stills for any other reason, but they'll tell you a story. And if you, if you remember these stills, I will relate back to them uh, many, many different times. But you can see, not don't just see the stills, See the courage and the sacrifice. Post-traumatic stress. If I walk out here, can everybody hear me okay? If you can't, raise your hand. You can hear me? Okay, post-traumatic stress. PTSD is an anxiety disorder that a person may develop after experiencing or witnessing an extreme overwhelming traumatic event during which they felt intense fear, helplessness, or horror. A traumatic event is one that is intensely stressful during which a person suffers serious harm or death or witnesses an event during which another person or persons is killed, seriously injured, or threatened. Um, please, when, again, the, the words tell you that it, it's an anxiety disorder. The words tell you that, that you don't have to be hurt you have to have fear. You have to feel the fear for PTSD to set in. It can be caused by many different things, and we're going to go, past, we're going to go through some of these things now. But it is an anxiety disorder. If there's one thing I want you to remember when you leave today, remember that PTSD isn't what's wrong with you. It's what happened to you. Some examples of what could trigger PTSD. Now, as I told you in the beginning, I'm going to talk about my war. I'm going to talk about Vietnam, and I'm going to relate things to my experiences. A serious threat to your life can cause post-traumatic stress. It doesn't have to be war-related. It can be a serious threat to your life. Now, it's been said that in a firefight, a door gunner's life expectancy is 19 seconds. So when we're doing a combat assault and we're doing troop insertions in, and we're receiving fire, they're not shooting at the people on the ground, they're shooting at that door gunner, they're shooting at that helicopter. So a serious threat to my life. Um, I believe that my experiences in Vietnam probably would, would fall in line with that. Seeing another person who has been recently, seeing another person who has recently been or is being seriously injured or killed. We had 20 people in the blue flight. We had a blue flight and a yellow flight. We had 20 people in the blue flight. I attended 11 funerals the year I was there. Seeing someone injured, we did body bag rescues, we did uh, emergency uh, medevacs. Um, again, this doesn't have to be war related. I, I, I'm here to share with you my experiences. Harmful or fatal accidents. I witnessed a helicopter crash right into the, uh, a stream on fire where, where people were on fire trying to survive. And we couldn't get to them. We couldn't get to them because of the enemy fire itself. Natural disasters. You know, I got, I got nothing for you with natural disasters. South Vietnam was probably the prettiest country, the most beautiful waterfalls and beaches I'd ever seen. Terrorism. For you students here, or for the people that, that might have experienced the war, you know that the torture of our POWs um, would, probably, would probably fall into that category. The, the, uh, the attacks, the... the, the, the the way the Viet Cong fought in the jungles. Um, everybody relates to the to Twin Towers as a terrorism, and what a, what a great example that is. Uh, but the night fighting and the hit and run tactics of the VC were, would certainly be considered terrorism. Assault, domestic violence, or battery, and I'm also gonna include rape, because it's the next one down. Now, as I began preparing for this presentation um, several years ago, I, I really wanted to use domestic violence and assault 
and rape, and I wanted to use it as a comparison to war. And I have, a, I have many friends, my wife included, said, Jim, don't do that. It, that's too horrendous. That is too horrendous. Don't, don't do that. So before I, before I even continue, I want to apologize to anyone who's been in a domestic violence situation, who's ever been beaten or raped, and, and, because I, ha I haven't experienced that. And I'm, I'm really sorry that someone might have, that might have happened to you. But domestic violence, um, battery, go back to the stills, and you saw it. You, you saw what we talk about. You saw what war can do. I want you to remember those stills, because they'll tell you. They'll tell you about the courage and the commitment. War, combat, life and death decisions. I'm going to tell you a couple of, uh, give you a couple examples of, of life and death decisions. I talked about the way the VC fought, and um, I'm going to talk about the, I'm going to tell you about the punji sticks. And uh, a lot of Vietnam veterans are here, and, and they know what they are. They're bamboo sticks that are sharpened to a razor point. And, and what they'll do is, is they'll dig a small hole, and they'll put a dozen uh, these punji sticks in them, and then they'll cover them with grass where you can't see them. And then as, uh, as the CA, the combat assault, or the team, or the LERPs, or whoever it is, is, wandering, is going through the jungles, the, uh, the VC will, will attack them very quickly. And then what they do, the, the 11 Bravo, the people would do is they would jump to the side for protection and they would land on the sticks. Now, they didn't kill you. They penetrated completely through your legs or your arms or wherever it was. But it produced great harm and it slowed the, it slowed the unit down. And life and death decisions would be, what would you do the next time? What would you do the next time that you're attacked? Would you stay in, in the open and return fire, or would you take a chance that there weren't sticks? These are life and death decisions that you have to make. Another one I want to tell you about is my friend Jerry Clapp. Jerry Clapp was a door gunner, just like I was. He's from Paducah, Kentucky. We were, uh, we were on a combat assault, and there was a hell hole. People know about hell holes. That's where the, the, the trees are so high that the helicopters can't get to the ground. So the people on the ground, the grunts on the ground, they would cut down just uh, several trees, just enough to where the helicopter could, could go down slowly and get to the ground. Jerry was on, uh, we were on a combat assault, and, and uh, Jerry's helicopter was called on to, to go down into a hell hole and, and do an emergency medevac. As he went down, everything was fine as he went down and he picked up the medevac. As he was started to go back up, he started receiving fire from, Jerry was on the left side, and the right, side crew, the right side door gunner started receiving fire. But he started receiving fire from above the rotor blades. So he couldn't return the fire. So he, from the mountainside, he was, he was receiving fire. Once they got up to where they could return fire, Jerry went to Lively. His name was Warren Lively. Warren Lively had taken a round through the neck, through the chest cavity, and out the backside. Now, the only training we had in, uh, only medical training we had in Vietnam was compresses. So Jerry took the compressors and he put it on the entrance wound and he put it on the exit wound. And he was holding lively for dear life. When the helicopter got up high enough, you heard the pilot say, receiving fire from 9 o'clock. Receiving fire from 9 o'clock. Jerry, Jerry, receiving fire from 9 o'clock. At that very instance, Jerry Clapp had to make a decision. Does he let Warren Lively die and return fire to protect the ship? Or does he stay with Warren Lively and put the ship in danger? My friend died when he was about 40 years old. I was honored to be asked to come and speak at his funeral. They didn't know how he died, didn't know what caused him to die. We just know that he passed away. But I can tell you, in my own heart to heart, in my own soul, I believe he died that day when he let Lively go and protected the ship. War, life and death, split-second decisions. Now, to recap, serious threat on your life, seeing another person injured, all of these are terrible experiences, terrible experience. Now, before I go off of this slide, I, I want to bring something else to your attention. Statistics will bear out that as a door gunner in Vietnam, I was in combat 240 days. 240 days, my life was in danger. 240 days, I saw people injured and killed. 
Now, if, these can, if, if any of these can cause post-traumatic stress, then think how deep that knife would cut if it was again and again. Think what would happen if you backed out of your driveway and you got in a, in a car accident and someone was injured. And then two weeks later, you go to a, a, a convenience store and there's a robbery going on. You're thinking, oh my God, what have I done? Why, why, why is this happening to me? Then maybe a month later, you get in a car crash and your best friend dies in your arms. 240 times. 240 times. Acute, chronic, and delayed PTSD. Acute, early onset, very intense, and resides within six months. Chronic, early onset, but prolongs longer than six months. Delayed, onset of PTSD over six months from the traumatic event, sometimes months after, sometimes years after the event. You know, when I first started to talk to you, I told you that I experienced all the emotions of war and it can be brought back to reality with a sight or a sound or a smell or something. That's delayed. That's delayed. I want to tell you a story about my brother Bill. My brother Bill, um, he called me one day and he said, Jim, have you seen Saving Private Ryan? And I said, no, I, I really haven't, Bill. He goes, boy, it's a great movie. You ought to see it. And I thought, uh, okay, I will. He called me about two or three weeks later and asked me if I'd seen it again. He's from St. Louis, and I was in Hobart at the time, and I said no. And he sent me a, a limited edition DVD of the movie. He said, Jim, you really need to see this. So one Saturday morning, I didn't have anything to do, and I put the DVD in, and, and I started to watch it. And uh, after about 30 or 35 minutes, I thought, oh, my God. Oh, my God, I hope this is Hollywood. I hope this didn't happen. I hope to God that our WW2s on the beaches didn't do this. So I shut it off and I went and found some people that were on Omaha and on the beach invasions. He said, that's exactly right, Jim. He said, the gate dropped, the first six rows were dead. He said, you, you went into water over your head with a pack and you tried to survive. When that movie came out, there was a spike in post-traumatic stress claims for veterans between the ages of 75 and 80. Weeks, months, years. Sometimes the demons don't never go away. Symptoms of PTSD. Now, I, I, I lump these two together because I think they're the demons that drive the car. Depression and isolation. Um, now I want you to keep in mind that all of this is connected. So what I say now, not only does it go back to the slides, but it's going to be applicable when I continue. Depression and isolation. One of the proudest moments I had in, in my military career wasn't when they put the Purple Heart on my chest or, or the Heroism Medal. It was when I was home. It was when I was home in O'Hare and I was walking the halls of O'Hare. I was in my uniform and I had my medals on. And I knew, I knew even though the war was unpopular, that people understood. People understood what I had done. And I was proud of that. Then I got home and the uniform came off. Went in the closet. I went, uh, after, after spending some time with my family, I went to the tavern where, where we grew up. And uh, as soon as I walked in, it's like, hey, Chancellor's here. You know, he's going to play shortstop and he's going to bowl for us. And I'm like, wait a minute. Wait. Wait, let me tell you where I've been. Let me tell you what I've done. Let, wait, just let me tell you. Well, that door was shut. So who, who could I talk to? Who would understand if it wasn't another veteran? So every time someone would try to reach out and, and share a story or talk to someone and that door got shut, then you become isolated a little bit. You're afraid to reach back out. You're afraid to talk to people again. This is what I got. Welcome home, Jim. Welcome home, Jim. You know, I was at a meeting one time and someone asked me, uh, do you resent the younger veterans and the yellow ribbons and... I'm like, absolutely not. My God, these guys deserve, a, every one of them deserves a parade. And they said, do you wish it was different for you? And I said, absolutely, I wish it was different for me. But it wasn't. We learned from it. We learned to support and love our, our veterans, our warriors, and that's great. That's what I got. But then when I went to the tavern, they wanted a shortstop and a bowler. This is where I was. This is where I was. Again, I had a story. Please let me heal. Please let me talk to you. 
Yeah, well, we got a game Friday. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. I'm going to show you a video from Daryl Worley. And I want you to watch the faces on the video. And when we talk about isolation and depression, I want you to realize that if you, if you try again and you try again and you try again and nothing happens, how you can sink back down. Watch the faces. Watch the expressions and on, on the faces. Isolation and depression. Wanting to talk, wanting to tell your story, wanting to share with someone who understands. But who might that be? Survivor's guilt. I started to talk about survivor's guilt before, the, before our tech got our, our uh, video back on. Survivor's guilt is when someone doesn't understand why they didn't die. Um, I had a friend named Bob Carnegie, uh, excuse me, Bob Carnegie's right here, Bob Flickinger, who um, we reded rededicated Wicker Park. In, and they, we had like 40,000 people there in a week, and we had the traveling wall. And, and Bob was in the Navy, and, and Bob didn't think he did anything. Anytime we were with someone, and he would say, he's a hero. Talk to him, he's a hero. Where Bob had this survivor guilt, and it just was eating him up. He was a banker, and he dressed impeccably, and about three days into the festival, I looked over, and he's sitting by a tree by the wall. I'm like, Bob, what are you doing? And his only response was, I can't leave him again. I can't leave them again. Survivor's guilt, and you'll see this. You'll see this will come up again. Now, can you imagine the, the still slides where the people are dying on the, on the ground and they're holding back someone to try to keep them from helping? How he would feel, why didn't I die? Why did he die? Why didn't I die? Anxiety reactions. Uh, boy, this is a tough one. Anxiety, anxiety reactions. Um, most men will, they're, you know, they're somewhat protective. They, um, you know, if they're walking in, in the mall and someone is walking towards them, you know, they probably will get between their wife or their friends and, and that person. And I do that as well. But I take it just a little, bit, a little bit farther. When I'm walking with my wife and someone is walking towards us, whether it be at a mall or, or anywhere, I watch, first I look and see if I can see a gun. Then I watch where their right hand is. I watch where they're looking. And... Nine out of ten times I will turn and watch and make sure they're walking away. Anxiety reactions. Sometimes when it snows, I will go to every window in our house and to see if I see footprints in the snow outside the window. 
I am on high alert almost 24-7. Anxiety reaction. Intrusive thoughts. You know, when I began, I told you that I was going to, I was going to talk about my war, my experiences. Um, I'll just say that I believe the vast majority of combat veterans are back into the mainstream of society, leading healthy and happy and fruitful lives. But there are people that struggle, and that's what this presentation is about. Intrusive thoughts are thoughts that something happened to you, and you wish you could change the outcome. You relive it again and again, but you wish you could change the outcome, but it never does change. Um, we were moving friendlies uh, off of a, a side of a mountain one time, and they, you know it really wasn't a mountain, it was kind of a hill. But uh, the helicopter, we couldn't sit all the way down because when a helicopter takes off, it noses down and it, it pulls in power like this. So to move the, the people, we just put the fronts of our skids down and the back of the skids were off the ground. Now these were friendlies. These were American sympathizers. There, there were no VC in the area. We didn't have any gun support with us at all. So we were just moving friendly people. Well, about the third time that we set our skids down onto the hillside, we started receiving fire from a wood line not too far away. Now, combat is the most exciting thing that I've ever done. I'm not trying to glorify it at all. It's terrible. But when a firefight breaks out and the brass is flying and the sparks are going, it, it is the most exciting thing I've ever done. But as we're on, on the, the side of the hill, everyone that was on that mountainside, hillside, knew that if they didn't get on that helicopter, that they were dead. That the VC would kill them because they knew they were American sympathizers. So as we, as we started receiving fire, I, I returned fire, and everyone was trying to get on the ship. And as soon as we tried to take off, it was too heavy. And Steve said, Jim, we're too heavy, we're too heavy. So as I'm returning fire, I reached down and I grabbed this guy by the shirt or by the hair, and I, and I throw him off. I said, let's go, let's go. And as Steve started to take off, he tried to get back on the helicopter. Now, I'm returning fire. As he tries to get back on the helicopter, I kick him. Kick him right in the collarbone. He instantly, as he hits the ground, he runs under my M60 as I'm firing. And in an attempt to get to the other side, he runs directly into the rotor blade. Now, he's dead. There's no doubt that he's, that he's dead. Now, I've wrestled with this for many, many years. And I'll ask you, did I, I didn't kill the enemy. I, I didn't kill someone that was fighting against me. I probably killed a father or a brother or, or someone like that. That thought comes back to me time and time again. What would have happened if I'd have done this? What would have happened if I would have done that? I talked about Bob Flickinger a little while ago, my friend. Um, he had a friend named Marty that, that Bob knew that I worked with veterans, and Bob said, Jim, will you talk to Marty? And I said, of course. Of course I will. He said, he's a carpet layer, and he sleeps in his van. He's homeless. So the first time I met Marty, he's like, who are you? I'm like, well, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just here trying to talk to you and maybe hang out with you. Well, Marty escaped reality when he drank. He drank to escape reality, and when he did, he would carve his unit initials in his arms. And I, I, I almost forced him to go to the VA. And once he got to the VA, they said, you've got an alcohol problem. And I'm like, what? He said, he's got an alcohol problem. He's going to have to go into six weeks of detox first, and then we're going to work on the, on the post-traumatic stress. I said, no, you don't understand. That, that blood runs through the same vein. He escapes reality through, for, with his alcohol. That's why he does it. It's, it. You can't separate the two. And they said, well, that's what we're going to do. And so Marty drank one night and, and uh, took too many of the pills. They gave him drugs where he wasn't supposed to drink to make him deathly sick. Took way too many, got drunk, and, and committed suicide. Now, that intrusive thoughts that I talked about, if I wouldn't have tried to help him, he might still be alive. He might have a, a, a life that's not worth a crap, but he might still be alive. Intrusive thoughts from war are are reoccurring things that come back to you over and over again. And you hope somehow you can change the outcome, but in reality you never can. 
I'm one of the luckiest Vietnam veterans you'll ever meet because I do not have flashbacks and night terrors. Flashbacks and night terrors where you can't sleep, where, where you relive over and over again. I don't have them. And I am very, very lucky that I don't. Symptoms of war, suicide, addiction, divorce, and homelessness. There are many, many, but these are the people, these are the ones that I want you to remember. 22 suicides per day, one every 65 minutes. What that tells you is one every 65 minutes, someone who was willing to die for you, someone who was willing to die so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we do, take their own life. It's unacceptable. There's more deaths from, from suicides than there are combat deaths. And if you think that PTSD or, or, or moral injuries aren't alive and well than our soldiers and sailors and our men and women, you're wrong. Addiction. 27% of soldiers met the criteria for alcohol abuse in the first three to four months after returning home from Iraq. One in four soldiers abused prescription drugs. 31% of veterans that experience combat are more likely to begin binge drinking. Now, follow me now. Isolation, depression, and suicide. I'm going to connect the dots for you. I come home, first in Vietnam, my escape from reality was, were, were, were drugs and alcohol. That's how, that's how I got away from the war. That's how, when the day was done, I tried to find some peace. My body was there, but I wasn't there. Now I come home, and I go to the tavern. They're expecting Jim Chancellor back. They're expecting the guy that left to come back, and I'm different. I'm not even close to being that guy. Now they shut the door. What was my escape mechanism in Vietnam? Of course, it was addictions, alcohol and, and, and drugs. So you can see how if I use that mechanism in Vietnam to escape the war, how, can, how I would use the same mechanism to escape from reality here at home. Addiction. Very understandable. Divorce. 42% of veterans divorce during or after their tour. The first 90 days after deployment are the most divorces take place for veterans. Common reasons for divorce among veterans are transitioning from to civilian life, renegotiating roles between partners, changing during deployment, changes during deployment, and influence of post-traumatic stress. Now, if I was 11 Bravo or 67N20, if I was a door gunner or, or a grunt, and, and I had made some life and death decisions that, uh, that didn't turn out right, good, and the, and the war is still haunting me. And then the issue of who takes out the trash or who does the dishes or things like that come up. It doesn't seem like that would be really important to me. And the war, the war isn't isolated just to the warrior. It extends to the family. We all suffer from it. But you can see the changes of roles, the addiction problem that might be included in, in, this, whole, in this divorce. It's all war-related, and, it, and it, it's part of the demons that live with some of us. Homelessness. 50% is the rate which veterans are more likely to become homeless when I, compared to other Americans. 75,000 veterans are homeless on any given night. I'm going to say that again. 75,000 veterans are homeless on any given night. 22, 22 people take their lives every day. 75,000 are homeless every night. Unacceptable. 20,000 veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are homeless in the past five years. And 5% of the current homeless population are veterans who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. Tough statistics. Tough to swallow, but reality. These are additional these are additional symptoms, not the big four that I, that I showed you. But I, I believe, I personally believe, this is my humble opinion, that an intense combat veteran will suffer from some type of post-traumatic stress. Now, I'm not saying everybody, it's going to affect everyone's life. It's going to be very detrimental, but they are going to be affected. 
poor memory, avoiding activities, feeling detached, difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep. I was writing these down and my wife was watching and she goes, are, are you writing down your symptoms? And I'm like, no, babe, I'm not. This is, this is from post-traumatic stress. And she goes, Jim, you need, to, you need to look at yourself. Lisa Patterson from the Vet Center was at one of my presentations and she spoke after me and, and she said, make no mistake, Jim's trying to do wonderful things. He's trying to help everybody, but Jim's trying to heal Jim. Jim is trying to heal Jim. Make no mistake about it. Anger outburst. Difficulty concentration. Exaggerated startle response. Um, a lot of combat veterans in this room. And without, without the show of hands, I'm sure there are a lot of people that can relate to these. Battle fatigue. Shell shocked. PTSD, TBIs, and moral injuries. Battle fatigue, World War I, shell shock, probably World War II. Post-traumatic stress came to the, to, it was always there, but it came to the surface, you know, in Vietnam. TBIs are a traumatic brain injury. Um, that's when there's actually an injury to the brain. And moral injuries. I'm going to spend a couple minutes on moral injuries. Uh, sometimes when I do a presentation, I put an easel board up and I write the number six. And I underline it. And I ask people, well, somebody raise their hand as soon as they know what that means, the number six. And nobody does, and then I'll walk over and I'll write TH behind it. It's the sixth. And then finally will somebody will say, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. I was asked to speak uh, one time at, at a, a church revival, and it was actually in the woods. And I talked to the pastor before, and I said, Pastor, I said, you know, what is the subject matter? What do you, what do you want me to, to speak about? And he said, I want you to connect God and war. I want you to connect those two somehow. And, you know, me being polite, I said, okay. And I hung up and I thought, how am I going to do that? God, an all-loving, all-forgiving God and war. And I couldn't do it. I, I, I couldn't do it. I fought with that speech for a long time. And what I ended up doing was I, I ended up asking the congregation, the people that were there, if I needed forgiveness if I needed to ask for forgiveness. Now I told them, I said, now I know God is all loving, all forgiving, and if I ask, he will, he will forgive me. I, I, that's not the question. The question is, should I ask? Do I need to ask? Do I need to ask for, what I, for the damage that I did? Or is it automatically forgiven because I followed orders? Moral injuries. I talked to a, a, a young veteran that, that went into a T somewhere in, in Kuwait or Afghanistan, not Afghanistan, but Iraq, and there was a fierce gunfight in the T of the road. And after about 45 minutes, he, he, you know, the fight was over. But the shot, you know, he, he was receiving fires from the rooftops and the windows and the doors, and it was a fierce battle. And when it was over, they went and they found the casualties that they killed, the women and the children that had died, the peripheral damages of war. Now, would he be forgiven for that? Of course, he didn't know that. But what happens the second time he did that? Or the third time he did that? Or, he, or if he continued to go into village and clear, clear buildings when he knew that the innocent was there? Simply following orders. Moral injuries and multiple deployments, in my opinion, will drive a veteran to the ground. And I hope and pray someday they change it. Now, we're going to close with, about, with a video from 60 Minutes. And um, again, I want, you, I want you to take this whole presentation from the stills in the beginning to what we've talked about in my experiences and then watch, watch these veterans. We've seen a lot of stories about veterans and post-traumatic stress disorder. But tonight, for the first time, we're able to show you new therapies that are changing the lives of vets and their families. Two million Americans have served in Afghanistan and Iraq. The Veterans Administration tells us that one out of five suffers from PTSD. One reason we're seeing so much of it is because many of our troops have been ordered on combat tours three, four, or even five times. The VA, overwhelmed by the need, decided to try new treatments that were originally designed for rape victims. Over two months, we were allowed to sit in and listen as our troubled veterans fought 
the war within. How can you live the life where everyone's afraid of you? You know, you go to town and people say, that's the crazy fact, don't mess with him. My wife told me, something's got to change or we got to leave. When you try to talk to somebody that hasn't been there, hasn't experienced it, they don't understand. And so you just kind of get laughed at. Yeah. The 16 men around this table arrived via Afghanistan, Iraq, or both. Some are here from Vietnam. I see that I do have, you know, that opportunity to pick myself up. <laughs> at 63 years old, just start all over again. They've started over again many times, but their path has led back to isolation, drugs, booze, and suicide attempts. Now, they're in the VA hospital in Little Rock, Arkansas, where they will live for eight weeks to break through the emotions that have derailed their lives. Depression, anxiety, anger, worthlessness, guilt. Guilt. Survivors, guilt. Why, why me? Why am I alive? Why are they not? That's one of the hardest thoughts to deal with, you know? Eric Collins was wounded in a rocket attack in Afghanistan. Over a year, 17 of his buddies died. How did you cope with these feelings of anger and depression and guilt when you first got out? Alcohol and lots of it. <clears throat> and that's where it started off. And the alcohol led to my depression worsening, which led to more substance abuse, crack. Cocaine is my drug of choice. So, <clears throat> my whole life spiraled and downward out of control. To take control, Collins volunteered for one of the new therapies called prolonged exposure. It forces him to work at remembering every detail of what he's tried to forget. Next thing you hear a loud boom. My ears start ringing. And I wake up, open my eyes, and I'm on the ground. Dr. Kevin Reeder runs the program. How are you feeling at this point? What were you, what were you feeling at that time? Anger. I'm scared. I'm feeling pain. My leg, my back. My arm, my whole body. Okay, let's go from the beginning. We're gonna keep doing this. Next thing I know, I hear a loud boom. They call it prolonged exposure because Collins will relive the story of the attack five times a session. There's a tape running, and he'll listen to his memory throughout the day to break its power. Tell me about prolonged exposure therapy. Sure. They've done everything they can to push these memories away. In the process, they haven't gained a full realization of the impact and the meaning that these stories have on their lives. I like to use the term, we're staring the dragon in the eye. Where did these therapies come from? A lot of these therapies came about uh, with members of physical or sexual abuse, those types of traumas. What are the similarities? The symptoms. The symptoms. The avoidance, the isolation, the hypervigilance, the extreme anxiety, irritability, inability to sleep, nightmares. Uh, same thing. Different sources, but same thing. Can't move my legs, can't move my arms. What does that do for you? It helps me to get past the guilt, survivor's guilt. And that's a building block. Every time I get through it, I get stronger. And that helps every time. It's okay to be alive. Yeah. And you weren't sure that was true before? No. I didn't want to be alive. I wanted to, I wanted to be right there with them. You know, the whole purpose of life was gone. To lose one of your buddies in a firefight, you don't want to see that. You don't want to feel that again. And so, yeah, when you get back to the rear, you're, you're, you're pissed off because you don't want to get close to anybody anymore. Anthony Apolito experienced those multiple tours we talked about. He fought for a year in Afghanistan, spent one month at home, then went to Iraq, and later, Afghanistan again. The more deployments you get, 
the more time you spend out there, it just keeps on stacking. And the first one, it hurts. But you don't get really time to heal. And then another one happens. And then another one. On his first tour, Apolito's patrol was ambushed. Two buddies died and 20 were wounded. I had no weapon. No one had my back. They write about days like that in the other key therapy here called cognitive processing. After a trauma or multiple traumas, often a person can believe the world just is a dangerous place. And so what we do with CPT, cognitive processing therapy, is they write an impact statement at the beginning of therapy to show them the impact of the trauma on their lives and on their beliefs. I have worked on it. They read that statement about the trauma to the group, and then they discuss how their lives are still held in the grip of war. I never had a fear of life. I never had a fear of living. I never had a fear of going to the gas station and getting shot while I'm pumping gas because I needed gas in my car. Mm -hmm. They plow through a workbook that challenges their guilt with statements like, I shot a woman in combat, therefore I'm worthless, or my friend was killed by the enemy. I'm responsible. Cognitive processing tries to put the war in the past and help them re-examine who they are today. It's tough. We noticed this on Apolito's workbook. How many of you would go back to a deployed environment with your branch of service right now if that opportunity was available to you? A lot of hands up. Real quick, why, why are your hands going up so much? We miss everything about how hard it was, how bitter you got, how angry and emotional, the things you saw. And it, you missed that camaraderie, that brotherhood, your buddy. Yes, uh, that downtime, the struggling with things. Man, you, it, it's everything, but you miss it. You mourn that. It's weird. It's that intimacy. It's, you know, I will never get that back. None of us will ever get that back. That's a Gable Darbone never planned to be part of that brotherhood he mentioned. In 2001, he was out of high school, headed to college. But then 9-11 pushed him to an army recruiter instead. My mom, I remember she was crying in the kitchen. She goes, Gable, you don't know what it's like for those boys coming back from Vietnam, how hard they had it, and uh, what they came back with. I said, Mom, it's different. No, we got attacked. We got attacked. I said, I'm volunteering. I said, I'll take anything. You know, I wanted to give my life. That's how strongly I felt. Yeah, I don't want to serve the country. I don't want to protect my freedoms, my future kids' freedoms. Darbone was one of the most thoughtful people we met. He served in Afghanistan and Iraq. One day, his unit was clearing a house. It exploded, and two buddies were burned. You get angry, get mad. You know, we um, get very angry. And we took it out on certain people. You know, and you enjoyed it at the time. You did. You did things to Iraqis that you're not proud of. Of course. But that was surviving emotionally, mentally. I, I was never a violent man. I became different, slowly. Uh, we all have that instinct, that survival instinct. And that survival instinct is very real. At home, the survival instinct didn't let go. Darbone was like most other vets here. Certain triggers brought the instinct back. The smell of diesel returned him to his combat outpost. Crowds made him fearful. I started isolating. I couldn't do anything. My dad had to come over mow my lawn. Mom had to come over and pay my bills. I just, I wouldn't leave my house for a day or two. I didn't want to make small talk. I didn't want somebody asking me, hey, how you doing? I, I didn't like those words. You know, I just, I got very secluded, like a recluse. For nine years, Darbone told himself he was okay or would be okay. And then the folks at work urged him to get help. This was Darbone after seven weeks of self-examination as they all prepared to go home. And when I went in, I had a heart. And uh, I volunteered. I don't blame nothing on anybody. I don't blame nothing on myself. I don't blame nothing on my leaders. In fact, I had good leaders. I blame nothing on the army. I think it's just the way it is. And it sucks. I hate it. I hate it. I don't want to go home. 
So what if what I tell my boyfriend when he comes back or how do I approach this to my son? I said when he starts talking, just listen. Uh, yeah, don't um don't judge it. Yeah, just listen. There is probably a soldier or a marine sitting alone watching this on television right now. Thousands of them. You might imagine it. And to them, you would say what? I hope you can find the courage to get help because all you're doing is killing yourself. And you don't have to live like that. There's good people in this world that are willing to help you and it's been the hardest thing for me to do, but I wouldn't have changed coming here for the world. In our two months here, 28 men sat around the table. Three couldn't endure it and dropped out. The VA finds that nationwide, about 77% graduate from this with a drop in their PTSD symptoms. It's progress, but they also have a saying around here, there is no cure. I don't think there is a cure for what we're talking about. We're talking about living and putting people more in touch with their lives uh, and emotions and good days and bad days. This isn't cancer, we can't go get it. We have to teach people that they can live with this and live a valued life, a life they want. After eight weeks here, how you doing? How am I doing? <laughs> I don't know yet. That's an honest answer. But I know deep down inside, things will work themselves out. From the stills to this this last video, and I want you, to, I want you to take some thought, whether it be today or tonight or, or the next day, and I want you to realize what, what war and multiple deployments can do to our veterans. Are there any questions out there? Bobby? Sure. When, when I went through what problems? You know, you're, you're drinking and things like that, and you're recovering. No, I, you know, I, I never really did. I, I didn't seek help. Uh, I didn't seek any um, uh, post-traumatic stress help. Um, and, and I probably should have. You know, I, I will tell you, I was doing this at IUN one time. Or, excuse me, yeah, it was IUN here a long time ago, and I had uh, Manuel Gonzalez with me. He's a double, amp amp double amputee Marine. And when everything was done, uh, and I answered all the questions, uh, he came out on the stage and he said, Jim, can I, can I ask you a couple questions? I said, sure. And he said, um, you know, uh, do, who do you work for? And I said, I'm self-employed. He goes, how many hours a week do you work? And I said, oh, I don't know. And he said, 40? And I said, yeah. And he said, 50? And I said, yeah. He said, 60? And I said, sometimes. And then he said, uh, are you married? And I said, no, I've been divorced. Um, at that time, it was three times. And he said, uh, do you drink? And I said, no, I don't. I, you know, I had some problems with it, and, and I don't drink at all anymore. He said, would you like to be in a loving relationship? Are you in a loving relationship? And I said, no. And he goes, would you like to be? And I said, of course I would. And then the next question, he said, do you think Vietnam affected you? And when I said no, the entire student body just burst out laughing. And he said, this is your typical veteran. He'll help anybody in the world, but he won't look at himself. So after that day, I wrote a letter to the VA, and I told them that, uh, you know, that I was a door gunner on a helicopter, and we did combat assaults, and we did body bags, and all the stressor part was, was over because of what we did. And I said, I bought, uh, I bought some buildings in downtown Gary, and, and downtown Gary had a reputation of being murder capital of the world and some, some rough areas, and I carried a gun to collect the rents. And in this letter, I said, now, am I trying to relive the high of, of combat? Because you know, if I am, then perhaps I need some help. I said, but whatever you say is what, what's going to happen. So they wrote back and gave me a, a, a small disability for post-traumatic stress and told me to sell the buildings, but, which I didn't. Are there any other questions? 
Well, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming out and allowing me this time to share with you. And uh, I appreciate your, your uh, staying here with me. Thank you.